can't manage what you can't measure. And that, if we want to put on a poster, on a neon sign, the main issue or problem in companies with cybersecurity, boom, that's it. You can't manage what you can't measure. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you know what time it is. It's time for Life of a CISO with yours truly, Dr. E is in the house. I hope you're smiling because I'm smiling too because this is my favorite, favorite time. We get to spend some time virtually. I wish we were together. We, we, you never know. We might be in the future, but it's glad to spend a little time with you talking about not just what is a CISO, not just how to be a CISO, but how to be a world-class CISO. Actually, if we're really honest, it's even more a little generic than that. I'll, I'll share a secret. I have a hidden agenda. For each and every one of you, I believe in you. There is greatness in you, and I want you to be world-class. I want you to be world-class in all areas of your life. Now, yes, I tend to tailor this more towards Chief Information Security Officer because I feel that's the biggest need and biggest gap. But really, if you want to be world-class in any area of your life, you can still listen to this. And what I also find is for some reason you decide, okay, I thought I wanted to be a CISO, but I'm realizing that a chief information security officer is not a technical advancement. That's the first biggest fallacy that if you can understand and you can learn is going to be huge for you. A chief information security officer is not a career advancement for a world-class security engineer. Biggest mistake, it's why we see so much disconnect, why we see so many bad CISOs. There's some good ones, right? So if you're one of the good ones, don't get mad at me, right? But, but there are some really bad CISOs and there's some folks that get really, really frustrated because the fallacy, and I see this all the time, we have our CISO cert, which is a six-month accelerated program. So if you want to get there quick and fast, then we do have a paid program. But like I said, I'm not one of those that the only way you can learn and get knowledge is if you give me money. So I do have the free. I mean, I, you can listen for a year or two to my life of a CISO and you'll get there. So if you want to go on that slower track, it's okay. But I do want to make people know there is an accelerated paid track if you're interested. But I hear folks criticize it and say, Eric, you can't teach somebody to be a CISO. What? First of all, that's crazy. And then they proceed to get crazier. They go, the only, and I always love when people use absolutes. When people use absolutes, they're usually, you know what, right? They're full, they're full of a lot of, you know what there. So, so be careful when people start using absolutes. Like I love this, all people. All people? You mean you can't find one that's not that way, right? So, so when we hear only or absolutes, be careful, warning signs. So they say the only way to become a CISO is to be a world-class security engineer for 12 to 15 years and then essentially hold your company ransom. They don't say that. They say it in nicer terms, but they say, and then essentially tell your company if they don't promote you to CISO, you're going to leave. That is the worst piece of advice, and that will get you to become a miserable, not world-class CISO. Because a CISO is not a technical position. You need to have some technical knowledge. You need to have some business knowledge, but it's not a technical position. The best CISOs I found actually are ones that work in IT or security for about three to five years. They understand enough to be able to manage a team, communicate with a team, but they also have a stronger desire and interest to help and impact the company at a strategic level. And they have that 
inclined to learn and understand business and how it works and how it operates. That's typically the path. Now, have I taken folks that have been in security for 15 years and have been able to turn them into world-class CISOs? Yes, but it's few and far between. Right? If we look at the scorecard of the number of people that want to become CISOs and the success rate, the highest success rate that I've seen is in that three to five year sweet spot. The highest failure rate has been in the 12 to 15 year world-class security engineer sweet spot. Now, I'm all about being different, right? I'm all about breaking the four minute mile, right? And all about exceeding expectations. So I don't want what I just said to create a limiting belief for you. If you are a world-class security engineer with 15 years experience and you truly have a desire to help the company be strategic and help cybersecurity be a business enabler, go for it, right? I do not want anything I say for you to cause a limiting belief in you. That's the worst thing I wanna do is I start putting limiting beliefs inside of you. So please don't go there. Please don't say, well, I've been an engineer for 15 years and Eric is saying I can't do that. No, 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 no. Eric is just saying, do a reality check. Spend some time checking and saying, is this really what I want to do? Because if you look at the people that have been world-class security engineers for 12 to 15 years and have successfully been a CISO, it's this. They have the heart, the desire, and they feel like it's their inner purpose in order to do that. Those are the folks that are gonna excel. The folks that don't are the ones that go, Eric, I really like what I do. I, I really enjoy the technical. I really enjoy being the best, being the world-class security engineer. I love being that guru, that Yoda, right, that everyone calls on when there's a problem in security and no one else can figure it out, and they say call Mary or call Jack, Jack or call Joe or call uh, Sally. I like being that person, but I feel like the only way I can make more money or get advanced is by becoming a CISO. Those are the ones that you should stay where you are. If you are world-class, you can make a lot of money. I know world-class chief scientists, world-class uh, security engineers that are making as much, if not more, than CISOs. So if you're doing it because you feel like it's your purpose and your drive, awesome. If you're doing it because you either want the title, a little ego, or you think it'll make you more money, those are the ones that you wanna stay away because you're not gonna be happy and you're going to be miserable if you pursue and go down that route. So I just always like doing that reality check. But here's the good news. Even if you decide that, hey, Eric, I, I like the technical, I like being that world-class security engineer guru, you should still keep listening, and here's why. World-class security engineers still understand business, and they still understand how they can help their CISO be as successful as possible. So there's still a role that you can learn here, but you're just going to take a different path in order to get there. So I just want to make sure that whatever path you choose, you are loving it, you are enjoying it, and you believe like it's your purpose as opposed to just, well, I guess after 12 years I have to become a CISO. That's the problem we're having today on why we have so many bad CISOs out there. Now, I've been on the road a lot, which, woo we're getting back to whatever normal is, right? I, I, I don't know, they call the new normal or things along those lines, but it, it's, it's been a while. Actually, it's been over two and a half years that I've actually had four keynotes in a month. And this, I have actually had five keynotes in a month. I, I just got back, uh, just so you know, we do pre-record these. This is my, this is real, this is not a virtual background. Uh, so this is my studio and this is one, one of my rules for consistency. I'm always going to record the life of a CISO in my studio. So you know I'm, I'm not traveling when I record this. Uh, so sometimes if I'm traveling for two or three weeks, we got to plan a, a little bit ahead on doing some of these recordings. So I'm back home, but I'm doing a lot more keynotes. 
Well, the good news for you is that means the mad scientist is back in his laboratory. <laughs> right? Because when I go in and do keynotes, I also are meeting with clients. I'm meeting with executives. I'm meeting with the folks that you need to work with as a world-class CISO. I usually, when I go in and do keynotes, I also do a bonus executive breakfast where the client can invite, usually I like to keep it to about three to five. We can go up to seven. I don't like much bigger because I like to get interactive where I host a breakfast with three to five executives and we just talk. Now, I'll be honest with you. It's an awesome win-win situation because they're able to ask me questions and I can give them advice on how they can better position cybersecurity, how they can go in and be able to make their CISO as effective as possible, what questions they should ask so they get a win. But I also get to ask some questions and find out where they're currently at. And one of the things I'm finding is I'm always about, okay, what is the problem, the root cause problem? So when I'm meeting with a lot of these executives, I still hear a lot, Eric, cybersecurity is our number one concern. It's our number one area that we want to focus on, but we're still not getting the information we need from the security folks. We feel like there's still a disconnect. We feel like the security folks in the CISO are frustrated because they don't think we're listening to them. We're frustrated because we don't think they're listening to us. And there's still this tension in the room where yes, we do have a CISO because we need it for regulatory reasons or for clients, but that CISO is not really like all the other Cs, right? I, I ask questions. Where does your CEO, COO, and CFO sit? And 99% of the time I get, they sit in the executive suite, right? They sit in a building in the executive suite and they all sit together. And if you looked at most corporate headquarters or buildings, it's usually that area where it's the nicest, right? There's usually glass doors and there's somebody sitting there. There's an entry to get back into the inner sanctum. And then before you can get into the inner, inner sanctum, there's more uh, executive assistance or control checks. So you almost have to go through two or three control checks to get into the actual CEO, COO, CFO's office. And then I say, okay, where does the CISO sit? And they're like, oh, they're over uh, in another building, either with IT or the one I hear, which is also scary. Oh, oh, they sit over in the data center with all the technical people. Hmm. So you essentially have four chiefs or five chiefs, four of them are together, four of them are in the same area, and one of them is isolated and by themselves. So you can start to see where the problem is. And then I also go in and hear this disconnect and everything else. But what I'm really talking about today is what I feel is the root cause problem, which is a lack of a measurable metric or a lack of clear defined goals in security. If you're a quality person and to be world-class, you need to be, you've probably read or heard of Peter Drucker and one of my favorite quotes is from Peter, which is you can't manage what you can't measure. And that, if we wanna put on a poster, on a neon sign, the main issue or problem in companies with cybersecurity, boom, that's it. You can't manage what you can't measure. So question, how are you measuring success in cybersecurity in your organization? How do you go in and measure or determine whether you're successful or not? Hmm, right? You're starting to see the problem. There isn't a clear metric. I go in and I'll ask executives and I'll either get, I don't know, or we get very dangerous answer. And the dangerous answer that I get from executives more times than not is, oh, Eric, if we don't have a breach, 
then we're successful in cybersecurity. Hmm. So I pull on that string a little bit. I say, do you have magical superpowers? And they look at me like, what are you talking about? I'm like, can you determine that you have a breach that you haven't detected? And they sort of look at me a little strange because it's a weird question. They go, of course not. Okay, so what you're saying in reality is if you haven't detected a breach, then cybersecurity is being successful. And they say, yes. Now there's two big problems with that. The first big problem is you're really incentivizing, if you think about it, to have cybersecurity, and I'm not saying deliberately or maliciously, but really to only look at the good. Because what you're really saying is if you don't detect a breach and you just look at all this good data that's saying no breach, no breach, no breach, then you're successful and you're all going to keep your jobs and get promoted. But if you start looking outside and start being detective and finding problems or issues, you essentially create your own problem by losing your job or losing your bonus. So that's problematic, right? You're, you're basically creating a scenario where they're de-incentivized to actually do what they should, which is catch or stop attackers. The bigger problem with that metric, you're going to have a breach, right? I, I always say it and everyone says it, but there is truth to it, that if you haven't detected or had a breach in two years, it's not because it's not happening, right? it's because you're not looking in the right area. And one of the big things world-class SOs do is they embrace the breach. Breaches are not bad. Right, breaches are not bad. I will say that again. Why? Because they're inevitable. They are going to happen, right? They are going to occur. So we need to stop this craziness that breaches are bad and recognizes that breaches are going to happen, right? right? Breaches are inevitable. So that's really the issue. The challenge we have is we either don't have clear metrics or each side has different confusing metrics. An analogy I'll give is, and I saw this with one of my friends. He felt that he wanted to get in better shape, and so he hired a personal trainer. Now, somewhere along the way, there was a miscommunication. The personal trainer thought he wanted to put on some muscle. He wanted to get lean and mean, right, and have some guns, right? The gun show is in the house with uh, sort so of rip muscles. That's what the trainer thought. My friend really wanted to lose 15 pounds. That was his goal. Two different goals. So what do you think happened? When my friend went to the personal trainer, the personal trainer's having him do pretty heavy sets, right, pushing it really hard, and then resting between the sets and really doing minimal to no cardio. And after six weeks, he put on some muscle mass. He looked, he looked much better. But even though he lost a little fat, we, we know muscle weighs more than fat, so he actually gained five pounds. So he comes in for a six-week checkup, does his weigh-in, and... The personal trainer is thrilled because his body fat dropped and he's pissed because he put on five pounds. And so you have this situation where the trainer's like, yeah, we're on track, high five. And the client is like, why am I high fiving you? I want to lose 15 pounds and you had me gain five pounds and they're pissed and both are frustrated. The client's like, why are you happy? And the personal trainer is like, why aren't you happy? And I use that analogy because that is cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is the personal trainer and the executives are the client. And you have that same situation where there's a miscommunication. The executives are sitting there saying, we don't want any breach. 
We don't want any compromise. And cybersecurity is like, we're about detection and controlling damage. So cybersecurity is like, yeah, we've had a few breaches, but we caught them quick, controlled the damage and no impact to our business. So they're high-fiving and the client, the executives are like, but why are you high-fiving breaches? That was bad. We wanted no breaches, right? And, and you can see that problem there. So what we need to start doing is coming up with and defining clear metrics when it comes to cybersecurity. What is that clear metric or that goal? And I like from Michael Hyatt, if you've ever read any of his uh, books, one of his great books is Best Year Ever. Uh, we're getting near the end of the year, so start reading it. It, it. It's really a good book on what holds you back and mindset and limiting beliefs. But what I like he does is, you've probably heard of SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, achievable, realistic, time-based. He goes in and he creates smarter goals and he changes it a little bit. Specific, measurable, actionable, risky, time-based, exciting, and relevant. So he adds those two pieces where it needs to excite you Right? And it also needs to be relevant to what you're doing. And he changes the A from achievable to actionable. So let, let's look at that. Good, clear metrics or good, clear goals, they're specific. They can be measured. How do you measure being secure? You can't. How do you measure being healthy? You can't. So what do we typically do? In medical, we go in and we put metrics. When you get blood work done, they're not going in and looking for health. Indirectly, but what are they looking at? They're measuring. They're, doing, they're measuring what your uh, glucose level is. They're measuring what your creatine level is. They're measuring your testosterone level. They're measuring specific numbers and then they're comparing them against the norm to say, are they within the range we would expect to see of somebody in your health? So there are specific and measurable items that we can look at. The problem in security is we don't have that. And that's why we're struggling because without a metric that everyone agrees to, without a metric that everyone's on the same page, we're going to continue to be in the same problem like my friend was with his personal trainer where the trainer's thinking this and he's thinking this. So we need to get that metric down. So how do we do it? So let's take a look at IT. And, and we can learn a lot because to me, IT is in the maturity range and cybersecurity is still not, not there, right? I, I don't say we're in infancy now. We're definitely out of infancy. But, but I would say that we're still in the adolescence stage in terms of getting where we need to be. So let's just take a quick review. In the late 80s, early 90s, companies started experimenting with this thing called computers. I know, it's, isn't it crazy? We didn't have computers on our desk in the 80s. And it wasn't really until the 90s that we started looking at or playing with these areas called computers. So when companies started getting a few computers and started looking at their potential, they recognized that they needed somebody to manage it. So they got a manager focused on information technology. And at that time, because it was an asset like a desk, a chair, they were buried under operations. So the operational manager that ran the facilities and one of the components was computers. So you had an information technology buried under it. Then it seemed like overnight, like we just woke up one day in the mid to late nineties and everyone had a computer. Everyone had a computer. Everyone was interconnected. Everyone was accessing the internet and everyone was surfing the web and doing email. I, did, I, I know there was a transition, but if you really think back, depending on your age, it really seemed like boom, right? it just happened instantly. Well, when that happened, 
companies recognized and said, this is so critical, we need a direct report. We no longer need the information officer to be under operations. We need them to report directly to us. So they created the chief information officer, the CIO. And the CIO often is either part of the core five, which is your CEO, your COO, your CFO, and chief legal counsel. So they're, they're the fifth one there. Or they report directly to one of those. So depending on the company and how information-centric they are, you either have them up there reporting directly to the CEO or typically reporting to the COO. So they now have direct access and visibility to the executives. The second thing that happened is we created a clear metric. If you've ever done CIO or work in that area, you know they have five nines. 99.999% uptime availability. Everyone's in agreement. Executives, CIO, IT, everybody knows that's our goal. That's our target. It's specific, it's measurable, it's actionable. You could argue, depending on the business, it could be a little risky, right? Because that's a pretty aggressive number. It's time-based. Right? You, have to do, you have to meet that average over a year. It should excite those folks that do that work, and it's very relevant. So it meets all the criteria. That is why IT is so successful. They have an executive that has visibility right into the C-suite, and they have a clear metric that everyone's in agreement with. You either meet it or you don't. If you've ever seen a CIO present to the board, if it's a good, healthy organization where they're meeting the metric, it's a five-minute presentation. It's, okay, we currently have this metric. We're exceeding the 99.999% uptime availability. We have these few projects that we're currently working on to help provide better access and accessibility. And we do not see anything in the foreseeable future that's going to impact our metric, and we're on track for exceeding that metric for the year. Any questions? That was probably two minutes, not even five. But that's, that's a presentation. Now, if for some reason they didn't meet the metric or they're, or they're a little below, then they'll go in and say, here's the reason why, and here's what we're doing to remediate it. Once again, it's all metric-driven can't manage what you can't measure. And it works extremely well. Now, if we look at cybersecurity, and the reason why I say we're still in the adolescent stage is it wasn't really, we're about eight to 10 years behind. So it wasn't until the late 90s to early 2000 that companies started really, really waking up that we need somebody looking at cybersecurity, right? We saw in the, in the 90s, I think it was late 90s, the I Love You Virus, Melissa, a few of those. Yes, we had the Morris Worm in the 80s, but that was really more research-oriented. That was before most companies were connected, so that really didn't trigger much. It was really the I Love You, Melissa, Code Red, Nimda, all of those late 90s, early 2000 that really had companies say, okay, we need somebody to be involved with security. So they brought in a security person, and they buried it under IT because they just felt, hey, it's sort of related to technology and computers. We don't know where else to put them, so let's bury them under IT. Now, over the years, as security has gotten more important, some companies have woken up and recognized that not only is security not a subset of IT, and companies have made them equals, but the ones that are really on target and mature have realized that IT is really a subset of security. If you look at what security is, it's understanding, managing, and mitigating the risk of your critical data being disclosed, altered, or denied access. Confidentiality, integrity, availability. What is availability? Uptime. What is IT uptime? IT is a subset of security. If you really take an honest, holistic view, it's a subset. Here's the problem. A lot of companies today, and this is not a true 
survey. This is sort of the Eric loose survey method. But just based on talking with folks, I would say around 55% of companies today still have security under IT. So those would still be infancy, right? We're not even adolescents there. Around 30% or sorry, so if you have 55, sorry, I, I got to get my math straight. So 55% still have security buried under IT. 40% have IT and security equal, and less than five, and that's being probably generous, it's probably smaller, have IT reporting to security. So we still don't have the true visibility at an executive level. If more than half companies have security buried under IT, and IT's metric is availability uptime, the executives are getting very little visibility into security. It's really, not, I'm not saying it's deliberate or malicious or anything like that, but it is being buried because if you are a CIO, and I, I've had CIOs yell at me and threaten my life, but the reality is this. I don't care what you think you believe. If you are a CIO and you are bonused and keep your job on availability, and that is the prime, whether you have a breach or not, you keep your job. But if you don't meet availability, you don't keep your job and you lose your bonus, you are going to either consciously or unconsciously be focused on uptime availability. It's just the reality. And please don't argue with me because, right, numbers don't lie, right? It's really going to be what your main focus is going to be. So it doesn't work. So the first thing I always push is we need to really, really focus in on making sure that if you become a CISO, you have executive visibility. You have that visibility into the executive suite. Now, am I saying that you shouldn't take a job if you report to the CIO? I'm gonna do an old Batman trick. When I was growing up and younger, one of the shows I did like watching was Batman and Robin. Now, if you ever watch Batman and Robin, they always end the show on a suspense, right? It always ends where Batman and Robin are tied up and they're about to die. And when you're like, what's going to happen? Like the, the dynamite is like 10, 9, 8. And then they cut into like to be continued, right? They always end on a to be continued. And the next show, they solve this issue and then they leave it on a suspense hanger. So because we're over my 30 minute limit, I'm gonna do a little Batman trick to be continued, right? So you gotta tune in next week, right? To the next episode to find out not only what do you do if you report to the CIO, but what is the metric in security we need to look at? Dun, dun, dun. Right, so I'll leave that suspense with you. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have an amazing week. And if we can help you, in any way, shape, or form, or you're interested in looking at our accelerated paid CISO certification, please contact me, ecole, at secure-anchor.com or go to secureanchor.com slash CISO, and we'll see you next week and continue our cliffhanger.